Good morning. Welcome to Southern Hills. We're so glad you chose to be with us this morning. Hopefully you grabbed a bulletin as you came in and uh, we've got a few things to highlight. On our sick list, uh, Clarence and Norma Cost, they have a new great granddaughter, Liberty Grace, uh, but she was having some unexplained seizures and some uh, breathing issues that long, uh, went along with that. So she's in the NICU, so we pr ask that you uh, pray for her. Uh, David asked me to announce that there will be no Monday night fellowship this week uh, at his house due to the holidays. Um, also, uh, tonight after the evening worship service, the Young Professional Holiday Party will be held here at the building in the fellowship hall. Uh, dinner is provided, so please bring a, a $20 gift for the exchange and uh, plan to stay for that. There's also going to be a group uh, for disaster relief tomorrow. Uh, at 10 a.m. doing their normal packing line. And if you can help, uh, please try to be there uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, Brother Danny will come up here in just a few moments and uh, have a special announcement about the contribution today. So I will defer to him on that. We do have some exciting news. We've had two births in the congregation over the last week. The first was Porter Dale Ing Ingebretson. So Michaela, uh, I've actually saw Porter. He was here on Thursday night for the performance. So. Uh, Excited to meet him uh, for the congregation. And also, uh, the Davenports have brought home Baker Timothy Davenport. So they're at home doing well as, uh, also. If you haven't picked up your holiday cards back in the foyer, please do so. They're out on a table uh, lined up by last name. And I believe that's all the announcements I have. If you have any other questions, uh, look at the bulletin for those. Danny? Good morning, everyone. We're glad that you're here. As most of you know, several years ago, we decided that on one of the Sundays of December of every year, we would have a special contribution. That is today. And you've been told by other elders that when we get enough money to take care of the budget, all above and beyond that will be designated for works that have been selected by the elders because we think they are very deserving. I know that several of you are excited about the fact that we're going to put some money down on a new van, and those of us who have driven the old one know that that's a pretty good idea. And then in addition to that, there will be money going to missions, and to benevolence. So we encourage you to please give generously today. If you didn't plan on giving this morning, you can give this evening or on Wednesday night or electronically, one way or another. We hope you will support this special contribution today. Every time we have had a challenge of any kind, this congregation has risen to that challenge. And we know that you will today, and we thank you for that. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that we're able to be together today. We are thankful for every good and perfect gift because we know they all come from you. We ask you to be with us as we worship you today in spirit and truth and according to your will, and that to you will be the praise, the glory, and the honor that are due you and your son. In his name, amen. Good morning. It's great to see you all this morning. Let's begin our worship by singing number 400. Number 400. I can't.
Our next song will be number 732. We praise thee, O God. Before opening scripture and prayer, let's stand and sing A Shield About Me. This song will begin with just the ladies and then everyone will join in the first chorus.
seated. This morning, we'll be continuing our reading in 2 Corinthians. We'll be in chapter 12, starting in verse 11. And I am reading from the New King James Version, starting in verse 11 of chapter 12. I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me. For I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Truly, the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it in which you were inferior to other churches, except that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me for this wrong. Now for the third time, I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. But be that as it may, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Did I take advantage of you by any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus and sent our brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? Again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions and jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumults, and lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and licentiousness which they have practiced. In Paul's letter to Timothy, <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writes the following. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. As we pray this morning, I would like to follow Paul's instructions to Timothy. Our prayer this morning will be a prayer of supplications that's when we ask, we plead, we beg God for something personal. Intercessions is when we pray for someone else in thanksgiving or giving of thanks, praising God for what he has done for us in our life. So as we begin this morning, I wanna begin our prayer with a little moment of silence so you all can take something personal that you would like to plead with God for. Then we'll pray for others and then praise God by giving him thanks. Let's start off with a moment of silence. Our Father in heaven, You've heard this morning in our own minds, in our hearts, something personal, something that we are pleading you for, something that we are begging you for. We have struggles, Father. We know that that's part of our life here on earth. Father, I beg that you hear our supplications this morning and please answer them. Father, we're also taught to intercede for others. And this morning, there's so many individuals that we'd like to pray for. I'd like to pray for those that are close to us, our family, our friends, our fellow Christians. Give us the strength to face each day and the challenges of it. 
Help us lean on each other. Help us have the strength to ask others for help. Father, we pray for our church leaders. They have such a great responsibility. Many a night, many a task that go often overlooked or not thanked for, but we're very, very thankful for them and their leadership. Be with our elders, our deacons, be with Garrett and his wonderful family, Andy and Jennifer, Cody and Nikki, all those that are involved in furthering your gospel. Father, we pray for those that are sick, that are weak, that need our help. We ask that you help those that are struggling mentally, physically, financially, spiritually. Father, we ask you that you be with specific individuals this morning. We ask that you be with the grand, great-granddaughter of Clarence and Norma Cost, Liberty Grace, while she finds herself at the beginning of her life struggling in the NICU, we ask that you help the doctors and the nurses determine what's behind her seizures and that she can start her new life in a much more healthy way. There are so many others that we have in our hearts that we need to pray for. And we're thankful that your son and, your, and the spirit intercedes for us on our behalf when we ask for others. Father, we give you praise. We're thankful for you. We're thankful for your plan of salvation. And we're thankful for the one thing that none of us deserve, your grace. Father, we're simply thankful and help us live a life that glorifies you. In your son's name we pray, amen. To prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll sing number 203, Hallelujah, What a Savior.
when I was asked to preside this morning, I tried to collect my thoughts and think this week and the last week and the coming, this is the time when the world remembers and takes some time to think about the birth of Jesus. At this time, we're going to gather here. We're going to think of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. In Isaiah 53, Jesus was described as a man with no form, no majesty, no beauty. He instituted the bread that we're about to take that represents that body. When these gentlemen take the cover off that, you won't smell some delectable aroma. Out of it. It's a simple wafer. It's a wafer made with water, oil, and flour. And it represents the body of the Son of God that was put to death for our sins. Would you bow with me, please? Our dear Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before Thee. We thank Thee for the time You've afforded us to come together here. We're very grateful that we can gather together around this table and remember Your Son. Remember His body that was put to death for our sins. And we offer this, this blessings and offer this prayer through His name. Amen. Further in the book of Isaiah in 53, in verse 5, he used the words, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. In a few moments, we're going to partake of the, of the cup that represents his blood, the blood that we shed as mankind. We shed and put to death the Son of God. We crushed his body for our iniquities. When you taste this fruit, you're going to have two discernible tastes. You'll have a tartness that should remind us of the brutality and what Jesus went through for our iniquities. There's also a sweetness there that we should savor because that sweetness and what he did will redeem us of our sins. Would you bow with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we bow once again before thee. We thank thee for this cup that represents your son's blood that was shed for our iniquities. We ask thy blessings upon us as we partake of it and offer this prayer through his name. Amen.
This concludes the Lord's Supper. The elders have deemed this an appropriate time for us to fulfill our responsibilities to the work of the church here. Would you please bow with me? <clears throat> Once again, dear Father, we humbly bow before you this morning. We're very grateful for the wonderful things that you bestow upon this uh, congregation here. We live in a, in a richly blessed area, and we have thee to thank for all that we have. We ask our blessings upon us as we return back to thee that which already belongs to thee. We ask thee for the guidance of the men who who's, who's use these funds for the furtherance of your work. We offer this prayer in your son's name. Amen. If you're using the psalm book this morning, you can mark number 125. We'll sing that at the end of Garrett's lesson this morning, number 125. Before the lesson, let's stand and sing number 19.
If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open them up to the book of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Isaiah 53, we are going to continue talking about Jesus this month. It is a month that a lot of people think about Jesus, and I don't think it's a good idea to to ignore it. I think we'll talk about him, and and I recognize that some people uh, might have some misconceptions about him. Uh, We want to go ahead and, and speak what we know about Jesus, and And what we're talking about today is, as mentioned, Isaiah chapter 53. If you've been following along this month, you'll remember that at the very beginning of the month, we we talked about Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus was in conversation with his apostles and he asked them a question. He said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? It's a good question. Who do people say that Jesus is? And and as they answered the question, we recognize that, that, that they, similar to many people today, had somewhat of a misconception about Jesus. Some said that he's John the Baptist, some Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And so Jesus asked a more pointed question. Who do you say that I am? I don't know, you've heard me say this before. Um, the way you answer that question is quite literally the most important thing in this world. Who do you think Jesus is? Who is he to you? Because he represents a lot of different things to a lot of different people. There's a lot of people who think he's a good man, who think he's a good teacher, a lot of people who even believe in his miraculous types of powers. But... Well, those are similar to what everybody else in the world was saying, right? Elijah and, and Jeremiah and John the Baptist, the other prophets, they were good men who were good teachers. Some of them even worked miracles. But, but Jesus wants you to think more about him than just that. And Peter answered, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. It's a powerful statement. Because what, what Peter believed about Jesus was not just that he was a good teacher, was not just that he was a good man, was not just that he worked miracles. He believed those things, but he, leaves some, he believed something more about him as well. And that is that he is the Christ. Like he is this chosen ruler and this chosen king that God has sent to the world, which, which is interesting because what that makes you think about is the fact that Peter actually expected that. That, that, that they were waiting for it and anticipating this king, this ruler that God would bless the world with. And so we're like, why was he waiting for that? Why was he expecting that? And that's kind of what we got into last week. And, and that's a big discussion that we don't have time to talk about in one lesson or even a series of lessons like this. It's a huge discussion, but it, at least um, within that discussion is this passage in Isaiah chapter 9. Where Isaiah is talking about this, this nation of people known as Israel who has completely rejected God. Who has ignored God. And forsaken God. And and Isaiah is writing about some of the destruction that is going to come upon these people. But what's interesting in Isaiah is that there's, there's really kind of two parts to Isaiah where he talks about, yes, their destruction. But but sprinkled throughout this book is this message of hope. Last week we talked about Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 where Isaiah is writing about this nation that is going to be destroyed and burned and consumed uh, by, by other outside nations. And yet he says, but to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. We should call him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And so it's like, okay, you have this nation right now that has rejected God. And because of that, you're going to go through some really terrible 
destruction and some terrible things are going to happen to you. But God is going to bring to this nation, God is going to raise up a child in it who, who will be the government in a sense, like will be the, the, the government and, and all of it will rest upon his shoulders. He will be the king and the ruler and the one with power and dominion and will know him as 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 a wonderful counselor and mighty God and everlasting father and prince of peace. And like we read about that and we see that's such good news and Israel waited for that and longed for that. And so I, I would ask like, what would you expect would be the, the acceptance of that one? Like Israel's waited for this, this child to be born, right? Israel's waited for this one that would, that would be king and ruler and all the government would rest upon his shoulders. Israel's waited for this one who would be this wonderful counselor and this mighty God and this everlasting father and this prince of peace. And so you would think that when that one came, they would be overjoyed. And, and, and they would hold him in such high regard and they would love him and adore him and praise him and follow him and serve him. But Isaiah tells us another story. Chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Like as you're reading throughout Isaiah, what you're recognizing is that they aren't listening. Is that they reject the message of God over and over and over again. So Isaiah asks, like, who's going to believe it? Who's going to believe our message? Who's going to see the arm like the power of the Lord as it's revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. It is kind of an amazing thing that, that when this child is born to us, that when the one who should be known as wonderful counselor and mighty God and everlasting father and prince of peace is born. God didn't send him into this world to stand heads and, uh, head and shoulders above everybody else. To be this physical specimen of a man that everybody would look at and adore and, and, and be utterly amazed by. He didn't have any appearance like that. He came looking just like a human. It's like an average Joe. And, and I think it's partially for that reason that he was treated the way that he was. He was despised and forsaken by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. It's like this average guy comes and starts claiming to be that child that is born, right? This average man comes who claims to be the Christ, and they said, no, uh-uh, I don't believe it. He's this wonderful counselor, but they ignored his counsel. He shows the might of God, but, but they rejected that even. He is, in a sense, the father of eternity. He gives everlasting life, but they chose death instead. The prince of peace, but they chose to war and to fight and to murder. They didn't esteem him. They didn't regard him. They didn't give him the position that he deserved. Isaiah goes on and says, Surely he has 
uh, our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. It's, it's, it's like he came to, to bear our griefs. He came to carry our sorrows. And we didn't hold him up in that way when we thought of him, how we regarded him as somebody who was smitten by God. It's, it's, it's this amazing thing that happens that Christ comes and he dies for our sins. And yet people looked at him on the cross and they thought, and God must not be happy with him. Look at him smitten by God. And Isaiah, he's like, no, no, no. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. It's not the case that you look on him at the cross and think God wasn't pleased with him. God smiting him for blaspheming who he was. That's how they regarded him. The reality of the matter is he was there, not because of his doing, but because of ours. And yet we thought it was him. My people walked by and they said, Psh, you're the son of God, bring yourself down. He can save others, but he can't save himself. And they mocked him and they ridiculed him and they treated him as if he was not. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. They treated him like a criminal. And yet all the while, he was up there because of the people who mocked him and not because of his own actions. All us, all of us, like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. It's interesting because he's going to go on He's going to kind of continue this discussion of sheep. And, and, and so hold on to what he says here. But I want to look at what he says next. Uh, he was oppressed and afflicted and was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to a slaughter. And like a sheep that is silent before his shearers. So he opened not his mouth. It's like when you think of a sheep, there's almost two different illustrations that's being used here. I mean, think of sheep on the one hand, they're kind of like, I'm, I'm not a shepherd, but everything I've ever read about sheep is that they're kind of stupid animals, right? And, and they don't follow instruction and they wander off and they need shepherds to constantly watch them. And, and if, if they, they'll wander off and, and like, they'll get themselves hurt and harmed. And, and Isaiah is saying, okay, in that way, we are like sheep. We wandering off. Like we, just, we, we keep going away from God and, and we keep getting ourselves into, into trouble. But you know, when you think about sheep also, not only are they, in a sense, unintelligent creatures, they're also very, in a sense, humble like, you, don't, you, don't, you hear about sheep getting tore up by the wolves. You don't ever hear about sheep going and tearing up wolves, right? Like, like, like they're, not, they're not the murderers. They're not the fighters. They're the ones who, who are harmless. And in that way, he says, it's kind of how Jesus acted. Right, Israel's like a sheep in that they keep getting themselves into trouble. And yet Jesus is, is like a sheep in the fact that, that while being killed, he could have, I mean, he didn't harm a soul. He's like, he's like, this, this, he's like this lamb that's led to a slaughter. And you would think like, like if a human is led to a slaughter, like they're fighting and doing anything they can to get away. You take other animals and you just try to go slaughter and like they're fighting and they're trying to save themselves and deliver themselves. A sheep just goes. It's just, he just went to the slaughter. He didn't fight. 
Matthew tells us that he could have sent legions of angels to destroy the world and set himself free. He didn't do that. He just let them kill him. He just went to the slaughter. Like a sheep before a shear, he was silent. So he asked this question. He says, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? Like, who considered that? Like, as, as, as you look at this man upon the cross and people walked by and they saw him there, like, are you thinking that he's there because the strike or the stroke was due him? Or are you considering the fact that he's there because the stroke is due you? Now, what's interesting, he's talking about this generation of people. And, and he says, he says uh, you, know, you know, for the transgression of my people. Like, he's, he's talking about Israel here, right? This, this whole book is about Israel and their rejection of God. But I think it's a fair question to ask of us. I think it's a fair question to ask of our generation. I guess more pointedly, I think it's a fair question to ask for me. When I think of Christ, when I think of his death, does it cross my mind that it was because of me? For my sin. Because there are times when I act like a sheep and I go astray. And I kind of do what I want to do, kind of live the way I want to live. Sometimes I act the way I want to act. Sometimes I'm rude. Sometimes I'm harsh. Sometimes I could act unloving. Sometimes I could be unkind. Sometimes I could say some things I shouldn't say. Sometimes I treat people in ways I shouldn't treat them. Sometimes I'm arrogant. Sometimes I'm proud. And I could just, could I possibly look and say, you know what? Now it wasn't because of him. It was because of me. His grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence. Nor was any deceit found in his mouth or any deceit in his mouth. It was going to be interesting and, and, and we're starting to see this change in a sense. On the one hand, he was numbered with transgressors at his death. It's because of the way man esteemed him. Because, because they regarded him not as he should be regarded. Not for who he really was. And so they killed him along with sinners, criminals, people who actually deserved what they got. But we're going to start to see the way God feels about him. And I think you start to see that shift in, in the way people who feared God treated him. Because it's not true that no one esteemed him. Some people held him in high regard. And what they did was they treated him like he was royal. Like he was something special. Because he was. Because he was not like those other criminals on the cross. So they buried him with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. There's no deceit found in his mouth. 
And so we ask, like, this is, this is quite an amazing thing. I mean, when you think about just the course of world history, that throughout the history of the world, man's sin and God's been working out this redemptive plan to bring about the Christ. And, and like, like, this has all been in the works of God. And he comes to this world and, and people don't hold him and esteem him and regard him the way that they should. And so we ask, how did the Lord, how did God, Yahweh, feel about this? And it might surprise you. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. <laughs> so they're like, what? Like, what, what, do you mean? what do you mean the Lord was pleased to crush him? Like, how, how, did, how did that give any pleasure to the Lord? And I do think, like, we talked about this actually not too long ago, but, but it is interesting to think about, in a sense, like, what, what are the things we want? What are the things that give us pleasure? What are the things we like? And, and, and like, sometimes with a man, like, it's, it's, it's very, uh, like, almost contradictory. I think the example I use is that like, like someone might say, you know what, you know, New Year's coming up here in about a week, right? Or two weeks, I guess. And like in about two weeks, we got New Year's. And what a lot of people do is they have these resolutions because there are things they want. All right, sometimes people say like, I want to lose some weight. And like, that's their goal. That, that's what, would, that was what would, would please them, right? That's what, that's what they desire and that's what they want. But then two, three, four, five days goes by where you've been eating good and all of a sudden you're, you start to want something else. All right, you want some, some pizza or you, or you want a hamburger or a cheeseburger or you want french fries or, or you want pasta or whatever it is. And you know like, okay, no, my goal is this thing. I, I want to lose some weight. But at the same time, I, I want this food. Right? We do the same thing with money. Like we say, like, we're going to sit down and we're going to do a budget. And I want to be financially responsible. That's going to help me in like financial security as I go throughout the years. But then like you see that, you know, pair of shoes on sale. And you're thinking, hey, I should spend some money on that. And, and, and I want this. I'm going to spend money on that. Like, like I want to be financially responsible, but I also want to keep spending money. Right? And like, like what happens is like sometimes the things we want and the things we want contradict. When we talk about what pleased the Lord, don't think that, that God is like overjoyed and happy and like in a sense like as we use it like, like, like in, in a frivolous sense type of way, like, like, like happy about this thing, smiling and grinning from ear to ear. You know, it, it's more, well, If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. The good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see and be satisfied by his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. He will bear their iniquities. Why was God pleased? It's not because he liked seeing Jesus on a cross. It's not because he enjoyed the fact that Jesus was suffering. It's because he knew that sacrifice would take care of our sin. And that pleases God. It excites God to think that that, that that a sinful people can be forgiven. People who, who deserve death can have life. Therefore, it's almost like God starts speaking now. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death. He was numbered with transgressors, yet he himself bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. 
because he did what he did. God says, I'll allot him a portion with the great. I'm going to make him great. He's going to be my chosen one. The Christ, the King. The passage reminds me of a passage that we know really well uh, from Philippians chapter 2. In verse 5 and following, where, where Paul says, Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, as he wasn't esteemed. Made himself of no reputation. Coming in the form of a servant. And being found in appearance as a man, like, 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 like a man without any, any comeliness or a man without any great desire of him. He, he came in appearance as a man and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Therefore, God will highly exalt him. God has highly exalted him given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. They esteemed him not. What do we think of Jesus? Said at the beginning of the lesson, there is nothing more important then how you answer that question? Who is Jesus to you? What do you think of him? How do you treat him? Let us never be like the people who esteem him not. Let's recognize, like Peter, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. Let's always treat him as such. If there's anyone in here this morning that's not yet a Christian, we would love to help you become one. If we can study with you, if we can pray for you, if we can baptize you this morning, if there's anything we can do to help you in your walk with God, we want to give you this opportunity to sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing this invitation song.
Thank you, Garrett. And thanks to each one of you for being here this morning. It's been wonderful to worship with you. If you are visiting, thank you very much for being here. We hope that you can visit with us some more after our services this morning. We hope that everyone can stay for our Bible classes that we've got prepared. And we'd love to see you all back tonight at 5 o'clock for our evening worship service. We'll close this morning's worship service by singing one verse of number 937, and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. bow with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be able to come here and gather here this morning and praise you, Father, and be able to worship you. Father, thank you for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon our congregation here at Southern Hills. We thank you for our members who enjoy fellowship together, Father. Thank you for our ministers who are able to do good works for you, Father. And thank you for our eldership and the leadership and guidance that they provide for us. Father, thank you for the special blessing to our congregation this week in the birth of Porter and Baker. We ask for your continued blessings for them and for their families and be with them as they enjoy this first Christmas season with their new children, Father. Father, we ask that you um, please continue blessing the works of this congregation, help our works be fruitful, Father, and do good to further your kingdom. Father, we pray for those who are unable to gather with their families for this holiday season, uh, whether they be essential workers that are unable to uh, be with each other or our military who is serving overseas, we ask for your continued blessings on them and their families. Father, thank you for allowing us to be able to gather together again this year and celebrate the holidays with each other. Um, we ask for blessings and for uh, you to watch over those who are traveling for the holidays this year. And we pray also for Christians who are persecuted around the world and unable to um, celebrate um, Christmas with each other, Father. Father, we pray that this holiday season you help us to reflect on the life that Jesus lived, the teachings that he uh, shared with us, and the example that he lived in his life, Father. And we pray that uh, you continue to Bless us in our study, Father, as we go into the next hour. And thank you for your son and the sacrifice that he gave for us. It's through his name that we pray. Amen.